Jesse Jackson took with him a man who is the manifestation and the incarnation of fire. He took with him a man for when we say that you should know the truth and the truth shall set you free, he took with him a truth giver. He took with him a man where we say that knowledge is power and knowledge can be the difference between life or death. He took with him a lifesaver. He took with him a man, a man whose genius and brilliance and ability to communicate and to talk and to touch chords, a man who has the ability and the temerity and the audacity and the unmitigated gall to stand up and say to white America all over the world that you are wrong. Let us welcome Minister Louis Farrakhan of the final call, the nation of Islam. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the One God, to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the Worlds, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. And in the name of his true servant and last messenger, our beloved leader, teacher, and guide, the messenger of Allah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, I greet you, my beloved brothers and sisters, here at Dr. King's workshop, Push Headquarters, and those of you who are listening in our radio audience with the greeting words of peace in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. <laughs> to the acting president of Operation Push, our beloved brother, Tom Todd, to the Reverend Willie Barrow, Reverend Riddick, to the distinguished platform guests, to the Push family, to the members of the Nation of Islam, and to all of you who are present this morning. We are here today to celebrate a great victory. We are here this morning to celebrate the triumph of God in his time. You know, the scripture tells us that God's coming is after the workings of Satan. It means that God's spirit would be present, but not in full power until Satan's time of work is up then God would make himself present and his power felt. We are here to celebrate the victory of God coming through one of his chosen instruments, the Reverend Jesse L. Jackson. I would like to since Reverend Jackson tells me, he says, brother, he said, I hear you, I know you're a Muslim. <laughs> he said, but you quote the Quran, it seemed like to me, once a month. <laughs> and, and he says, I think you're a frustrated Baptist preacher. <laughs> So I take all of that <laughs> because I refuse 
to be divided by labels. I am indeed not a frustrated Baptist preacher, but a highly spirited Baptist preacher. And I am indeed a Muslim. Both of them say the same thing, if you really understand. So, I'm going to read this morning from the Holy Quran. A book that most of this Western world is not familiar with. It is the 110th chapter of the Holy Quran titled Al-Asr, The Help the help. And it reads like this, in the name of Allah the Beneficent, the Merciful, when Allah's help and victory comes, and you see men entering the religion of peace in companies, celebrate the praise of thy Lord and ask his protection. Surely he is ever returning to mercy. This is the 110th chapter of the Holy Quran. Notice whose help comes. When Allah's help, when God's help, when Shiloh's help, when Yahweh's help, when Christ's help comes, then victory comes. Victory doesn't come on our own. It comes when you have the help of the divine being intervening in our affairs. When Allah's help and victory comes, how should you act? When you see men entering the religion of peace in companies, how should you act? Should you say, this is my victory? I, I, I did it. But this is my victory. Look what I have done. The scripture says, celebrate the praise of thy Lord and ask his protection. Why should you ask his protection? Because when God gives us a victory, it is so magnificent, it is so great, it is so overwhelming, it is so stupendous, so colossal, that people then will look upon you as more than what you are. But if you ask God's protection and give God the glory and celebrate his praise, then it says, surely he is ever returning to mercy. My, 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 my. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us nothing is impossible. When the Reverend Jackson decided to go to Syria to retrieve his brother, Lieutenant Robert Goodman, a Navy pilot. People said it's impossible. What are you going there for? You're going on a fool's errand. It's nothing, nothing but a publicity stunt. Many who were on the trip with the Reverend Jackson wanted Reverend Jackson to get an assurance from the Syrian government that if he went, that the young pilot would be released even before he went. But he had no such assurance. So many that were on the mission with him would not go because it was too politically risky. <laughs> in uh, brother's delegation in talking to some of those whose feet were getting cold said this is a mission of faith that's right. that's right and if 
you already know the outcome, then there is no test in your faith in the God that you say you believe in. The Reverend Jackson had only one assurance, that he was welcome to Syria and that he would meet with the president, Hafez Assad, but the outcome, only God knew. <laughs> it wasn't impossible to Reverend Jackson, nor was it impossible to those of us who journeyed to Damascus with him. We knew that when things are impossible, for man, they are pregnant with opportunity for God's magnificent power to manifest itself. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us that when Almighty God created the universe from nothing, he destroyed the impossible. Mind you, he created the universe from nothing. 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 My, 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 my. So, if you really want God's help, don't ever think too much of yourself. Man has a terrible habit of thinking himself to be self-sufficient. Therefore, he is ever ungrateful. But when a man or woman will humble himself or herself to Almighty God, recognizing God's greatness and our insignificance, then he, the great one, can manifest his power through our insignificance. So the scripture says he created man from the dust of the earth, trying to tell man, I got you from nothing also. you from dust don't get too big for your shoes I made you from nothing and when you were formed from the dust of the earth it was not you who breathed into your nostrils it was I who breathed into your nostrils and then you became a living soul the Quran differs a little with the biblical story of creation though the Quran uses the word dust and clay it says man in his first state is considered nothing our first state is sperm and sperm is nothing to speak of is that right we just don't have conversations about sperm. <laughs> but yet, oh, pardon me, I hope I didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> but from sperm, all of us evolved by a power and an intelligence bigger than ourselves. So if you want the help of God, return to that position or mind or state of nothingness and then call on the only reality to aid you and then that reality will manifest himself through you. So this chapter is called the 110th chapter. Now notice you have two ones and a zero. <laughs> Now, since we all bear witness that we are nothing and only God is something, the Bible tells us that God is one. The Quran tells us, Kul huwa Allah ahad. Say he, Allah is one. If we are zero and God is one, when God, the one, comes to stand in back of nothing, then the nothing is raised to the power of 10. Is that right? So when we 
went to Syria, we went with a prayer. We started with a prayer on this side and prayer followed us every step of our journey because we recognized our nothingness but we were hoping that the one God would get in behind us to make something out of nothing. I was pleased and honored to be with our brother, the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson on this mission. I watched him work. And I wasn't watching him work. I was watching God working through him. As I said at Push a few weeks ago, you got to be able to see when man leaves off and when God comes in. No wonder the analysts can't analyze the effect of this trip. Because the analysts are like the government. They are blind. And the blind are leading the blind and therefore both are headed into the ditch. They can't see when God intervenes in the affairs of men. Today we challenge what you think is impossible because God wants to make himself known in the world today and what better people could he choose to make himself known than a people who have been reduced to ashes, to dust, to zero, to art, to nothing. And God says, I'll take one or two or 10 or a hundred of nothing and I will stand behind nothing. And then you got a number that no man can count. When we got to Syria, the Reverend Jackson and his delegation were invited to the foreign ministry to talk to the second most powerful man in Syria, the foreign minister, Abdul Halim Kadam. We're not cussing, that's his name. The Reverend Jas Jackson began to speak. The room was filled with Syrian high officials and of course the Reverend Jackson's delegation. When the Reverend finished speaking, the foreign minister through his interpreter began to speak. He appreciated the Reverend Jackson. They know him well there in Syria and throughout the Middle East. And I must say this at this juncture, of any black person in America, there is none more respected in the Middle East by the rulers and kings of that area than Reverend Jackson. They said we respect your humanitarian gesture, your call to us, but we are, in, in, in words, in a state of war alert. We have been bombed by America. How can we let this young man go and keep our troops morally prepared to fight a war if necessary to defend their own homeland? How can we let him go? What effect would it have on our own people, on the morale of our own troops? After all, we made no aggression against America. They were flying reconnaissance flights over our 
our positions. We fired on their planes. We didn't strike their planes. We fired on their planes to let them know that we do not appreciate their uh, coming into our territory, flying over us. After all, we could not fly over America. And we could not even fly over their aircraft carriers, which are in our waters, and we are not in theirs. We appreciate your appeal, Mr. Jackson, but we cannot be more Americans than the Americans. In other words, we cannot be more liberal to fight for this black pilot's release and your own government don't fight for his own release. I was sitting at the table. I, his point was strong. Lord, it was strong. <laughs> but I must tell you, beloved, the Reverend Jackson looked up and he began to speak and it looked like God had jumped in his mouth. <laughs> and our brother said, I didn't come on a mission seeking justice. I didn't come here because America was morally correct. I came on a mission of mercy. I don't argue the rightness or wrongness of the man. I'm seeking mercy and a lowering of the temperature of war. That peace may come and a breaking of the cycle of pain take place. Undaunted, he pressed his point, and as he pressed his point, I saw the foreign minister yield, and the foreign minister said, well, he sounded like a Baptist preacher, well, he said, I will take your appeal and represent it to the president. He said, and we will see if we can find an equation that will give you what you want and us what we want. We retired and we deliberated over the word equation and what that might mean. Because the Reverend Jackson was not in a position to negotiate, he had nothing to give. We prayed again. And the next meeting we had was with the top religious leaders in Syria, Muslims and Christians. We sat around the table and the Reverend Jackson put his case before them. And then they made their strong appeal. They said, we pray that the pilot be released. We also share your concern that peace comes. But we want America to know that we also are human beings. You expect us? In words, they said, you are insulting us. Our people have been bombed and killed. And you ask us to do this thing, let this man go. Their appeal was strong. The Reverend Jackson bounced back. In words, he said to them, we are not denigrating your humanity by asking you to let this young pilot go. We are appealing to your greater sense of humanity. When the Reverend Jackson 
finished with the religious leaders, we were hugging and kissing and embracing. But there was one more hurdle to go. The next day, he had to meet with the president, President Assad. When he went to meet President Assad, they were very courteous, loving, warm in exchange of greetings, but the answer was definitely no. No. Reverend Jackson again came back with an appeal. His appeal was so strong that President Assad said, I will reconvene the appropriate bodies and I will give you the decision of our deliberation within a few hours. And we came back to the hotel, the Reverend Jackson and those that were with him came back to the hotel and we prayed again. No call for an hour, no call for two hours, no call for three, no call for four, no call through the night. In the, during that night, he did get a call from the president's secretary telling him if you would please postpone your flight. We were scheduled to leave the next morning at eight o'clock. Postpone that flight. Reverend Jackson said, certainly we will postpone the flight. And we gathered again and prayed again. And the Reverend Jackson said, when the jury is deliberating a long time, that's in your favor. <laughs> sure enough, the next morning, the Reverend Jackson was summoned to the foreign ministry. And in a very short word, the foreign minister told the Reverend Jackson that your appeal has been heard. And President Assad has agreed to free Lieutenant Robert Goodman as a humanitarian gesture. No matter what the people want to make of it, it was God's victory. And he used the country preacher for America, bombing people. How could you go? What justifies your going? I am a defender of my poor and suffering people. So I opened the scriptures of the Bible to John, the ninth chapter, where it reads that there was a certain man that was born blind. And when the disciples walked with Jesus, they asked, who did sin? That this man is born blind. Did his father sin? Did his parents sin? Did he sin? And Jesus answered saying, Neither he is born blind that the works of God might be made manifest in him. I said, Do you mean that blindness is an opportunity for God? Jesus told the young man, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Yes. If you look at the word Siloam, S-I-L-O-A-M, you know the Eastern languages are phonetic languages. If you look and take the vowels out, you get the word S-L-M. These are the phonetic, uh, phonetics there. The vowels are I, O, and A. But look at these consonants, S, L, and M. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. The very last part of the word Jeru Salem. Salem, S, L, M. Jeru Salem means a city founded in peace. Go wash in the pool 
of peace. Salam, Salam, Islam, Muslim, they all mean peace. Go wash your eyes in a truth that will bring peace to your troubled mind and open your blinded eyes. Go, boy, and wash in the pool of Salon. And he washed and he came away seeing. Yes. And when they saw him, they said, Is this he that sat and begged? How have you now seen? He said, I met a man named Jesus. And he opened up my eyes. Yes, sir. But the scribes and the Pharisees didn't want to give Jesus any credit. You see, they were blind like the politicians and the writers of America today. They wanted to give the healing of the man born blind some cynical motivation, some diabolical motivation. So they said to the man, the little boy's mother, how come your son sees? He said, I don't know, he's of age, why don't you ask him? <laughs> so when they questioned him, he kept saying, I see. They said, yes, we see, you see, but by what power do you see? <laughs> this man, Jesus, is a wicked man. He does these things by the power of Beelzebub by the power of the devil. So the young boy said, has there ever been in history a time when a man born blind has been healed? Does God hear the prayer of the wicked? So the blind boy came back and said, well, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but this I know. Whereas I was once blind, now, I see. Jesus went on to say, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. <laughs> Meaning that I am the truth that I speak is the means by which you see because you can only see by the light. <laughs> is that right? But look at this revolutionary idea that the Jesus introduced. You know that the earth is constantly revolving, is that right? When we were in the light in Syria, you were in the darkness in the West. And the earth keeps turning so that that which is in the darkness comes up into the light and that which is in the light goes down into darkness, is that right? So Jesus declares his revolutionary mission in the world. He said, I am coming to the world that those who are blind may see and that those who say they see may go blind. <laughs> then they asked him, do we, are we guilty of sin? They said, if you are blind, then you have no sin. But inasmuch as you say you see, then your sin remains. What does that have to do with Robert Goodman and the Reverend Jesse Jackson and the government of America? What does that have to do with black people in this country? Jesus was making a parable. A parable is a story that has a deeper significance pointing to some greater event. <laughs> Who did sin that black people are in this condition? Did your father sin? Did your mother sin? No, beloved. You are in this condition that the works of God might be made manifest in you. But I, you say, I'm not blind, I can see. The scripture says you have eyes, but you cannot see. 
because the light by which you see has not arisen upon you. The light of truth, the light of knowledge. This is why Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But until the truth comes, then you don't have the light by which to see and therefore you are born blind. A man born blind has never seen the sun. And a people born blind have never seen what it means to be free, which the sun represents. It is you and I who sing that song. I wish that I knew what it means to be free. How come you don't know what it means to be free when God has birthed every life out of darkness to know the joy of his freedom? But you don't know it because you've never been free ever since the day that your father set the soles of their feet in the Western Hemisphere. You and I as a people have never enjoyed freedom. You have not known. You have not known the meaning of the star. That star represents justice and we have not had justice one day in America. We have not known the meaning of the moon which represents equality because it equalizes the waters of the earth. We have never been equal. When you don't have eyes and you're born blind, you never saw your mother. If you knew your mother, you would speak your mother tongue. You would be in the culture of your mother, but mother gone, father gone, the motherless children see a hard time. The man born blind never could look in the mirror and see himself. He couldn't see his brother or his sister, and we never saw each other. As family, we never saw ourselves. We saw ourselves through the light of the knowledge given to us by white people. And they made us see ourselves as niggers, coons, colored people, shines, ham bones, burr heads. (laughs) We were born blind. blind but today not only do we need a man named Jesus we met a man named Jesus and our eyes are no longer closed the government may come and question us how come you see who made you see I came to see the light of truth by the majesty of a word coming from the mouth of the honorable Elijah Muhammad And the moment I said I saw, the government was interested. How come you see? (laughs) They weren't interested when I was blind. They just wanted to know how I got to see. They know they didn't teach me. They know they didn't train me. I never went to their schools of theology. I'm a product of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now they want to make me believe that the man by whom I see is a wicked man, is a no good man. Like they want to make us believe that the man by whom God gave us this great victory is a megalomaniac. This is what they call our brother, a megalomaniac. They call him a mischief maker. Why are you so troubled, white folks? Why are you so troubled? Suddenly, this is not all Caucasian people. I'm speaking de- deliberately to the government, to those who manipulate the minds of men. Why are you troubled? What is troubling you, Ahab? <laughs> is my brother Jesse troubling you? The scripture says, I'm going to vex you with a foolish people. 
I'm going to take a people that were nothing and I'm going to bring them up right under your feet and vex you with them. I'm going to work in them. They're going to be my people and I'm going to be their God. the wisdom of this world and I'm going to make it foolishness. Think over that. All these so-called wise people couldn't act with wisdom and one of those that they had labeled fool came up acting with wisdom and stepped out on the international scene like Peter walking the water only he kept his eye on the master. Peter, the boat gives you buoyancy. Come on out of the boat. Come on out of where it's safe, Peter. I want you to dare to believe that I've got power to uphold you on the water. Come on out of the boat, Jesse. And Jesse got out of the boat and went to walking over the people. I said, what you gonna do? You're on a fool's errand. But they are the fools, but they know not. They are the fools, but they perceive not. I've come into the world that those who have not seen, that they may see, and that those of you who say you see may go blind. Robert Goodman was a pilot, and he was a bombardier pilot. Dear brother Robert dropped the bombs that killed people. And Brother Robert said, after what I had done, I don't know why the Syrian people treated me like they did. Listen now. The people that the propagandists would make you believe are rotten people, no good people, savage people, anti-American people, haters of America. Here's a pilot that dropped bombs on them. And for the first four days, they had him in a cell. Oh, they smacked him a few times, but he admitted it was not to hurt me, just to scare me. <laughs> and after the fourth day, they brought him up out of a cell and gave him a room. with a television in it. <laughs> they fed him so much food till he had to send it back. He gained weight in captivity. <laughs> he said he, he was thinking that maybe they were running a mind game on him. But the ambassador came, Ambassador Paganelli, and told him, this is not a mind game. They, 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 they are sincere. Islam, the Quran teaches us that when you have captured a person, you are not to mistreat your captives. The Bible teaches the same thing. Both the Bible and the Quran teach respect for authority. Obedience to those who are in authority. He's a pilot. He doesn't make policy, he follows policy. So in following out the policy, he became the instrument of the foreign policy of those who see, but the pilot was blind. Did you hear me? He dropped the bombs, but he's an innocent man because a blind man hath no sin. If you use a hammer, the hammer doesn't have eyes to see the nail. The hammer is the instrument of the carpenter. The eyes of the hammer are in the head of its holder and its director. The eyes of the soldier are in the heads of the generals and those who make policy. He's a blind man. 
on a blind mission from blind leadership whom Jesus the Christ is turning blind now. They're doing foolish things, breaking up their world because they're blind. We could defend Robert Goodman because he's a blind man and he is not guilty of sin. He was the instrument of a sinful foreign policy that the Reverend Jesse Jackson has sight enough from the Lord of the worlds to condemn it as a mischief-making policy. Jesse Jackson sees and because he is blessed by God to see he can do what the blind leaders of this country are unable to do. I'm almost finished. In this Quran, can I take about five more minutes? In this Quran, in a chapter, a section titled Lip Profession. It says, and there are some people who say, we believe in Allah and the last day, and they are not believers. That's right. You can't say you believe in God and believe in the last day or the day of judgment or the day of justice, and then do that which will get you what you earn. They say they believe, but they are not believers. The government of America does not really believe in God. This government believes in its own wisdom, its own power, its own might, not the power and the might of God. Listen, they seek to deceive Allah and those who believe, and they deceive only themselves but they perceive not. Now when people try to deceive God and true believers in God and then end up deceiving themselves but don't even know that they are self-deluded and self-deceived, that is a form of blindness. Now just look at this Quran. If you don't think it's applicable, it says, in their hearts is a disease. So Allah increased their disease and for them is a painful chastisement because they lie. What is the disease in the heart of the American body politic? What makes them so blind that Jesse can see and the president cannot? What makes them so blind that Jesse can see and Mondale and Hart and Glenn have to wait until Jesse makes a move and then tap on behind him? Jackson, the megalomaniac is the government of America and those Caucasian powers that think they have become a god beside God. And their megalomania has blinded them. Their corruption has blinded them. Their evil has blinded them. And when it is said to them, Make not mischief in the land. Listen to what they say. We are the peacemakers. <laughs> the Quran reads, Now surely they are the mischief makers, but they perceive not. Listen to the president. He said, Lieutenant Goodman was on a mission of peace. Either he's crazy 
or he wants us to believe that we crazy. Here's a man with a plane full of bombs flying over somebody else's country, dropping bombs, but he's on a mission of peace. Somebody is blind, brother and sister. Somebody's crazy, brother and sister. Somebody's self-deluded, brother and sister. Last verse I'm going to read. <laughs> Allah will pay them back their mockery. And he leaves them alone in their inordinacy, blindly wandering on. These are they who buy error for guidance. So their bargain brings them no gain, nor are they guided. The government is like a ship without a rudder. It is moved now by winds. It cannot stay the course. It's a blind country with blind leadership leading blind people into the ditch of hell. And from the ranks of the blind, God has made a few to see. Their parable is as the parable of one who lights a fire and when it illuminates everyone around him, the fire goes out. They are in darkness, the Quran says, they cannot see. I have come into the world, Jesus said, that they who do not see may have their eyes opened and I have come into the world that those who say they see may go blind and if there is mercy in the seeing man he will take the blind man by his hand and lead him there is mercy in a black people who have been destroyed and whom God is opening their eyes. They will say to the government, follow me, I know the way out of this. <laughs> so in my conclusion, when I was in Damascus, oh, like Paul on that road, I saw, too, a great light. Well, think about it. Only God could have made such circumstances. A black pilot. You know pilots are few. Black pilots are even more few. Here he is in a plane. Now, think about this. The plane gets hit, and he said he's six inches from the, his co, uh, 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 the pilot of the plane, he's the navigator bombardier. <laughs> six inches. The plane is hit. He said he feels the plane shake. And when he looks, the plane is turned over. He's looking down at the ground. He blacks out. He don't know how he was ejected. But he's ejected downward, not upward. There's a rocket under the seat that shoots him through the canopy. But he's not shoot, shooting up. He's shooting down. He's already flying low. When he wakes up, his hands are being tied behind him, but he's alive. Yeah. Do you hear me? He's alive and his partner is dead. He's taken into captivity and there in captivity, Reverend Jackson gets the inspiration to go and get him because Jackson had met 
with Reverend, I mean, uh, President Assad before and knew him on a personal level. And Brother uh, Jackson leveraged his faith in God and leveraged his friendship with Assad and leveraged his will to lift this issue above war and into the humanitarian category and came away with a victory. And isn't it interesting that the first primary in the season is in New Hampshire and the brother is from Concord, New Hampshire. Who could, who could fix up circumstances like that? Jesse didn't call that shot. He didn't say it's a political thing, I'll fix it. I need some votes in, in New Hampshire. They don't think I can get nothing in New Hampshire, so I'll just have a, a, a black pilot from Concord fly over and get shot down. Well, hell, if Jesse could do that, we don't need an election. He's God. Let's get behind him. As I said before, God is with this brother. Yes, and if you are not with this brother, you're on the wrong side of history and on the wrong side of God. I say to you, brothers and sisters, it's your day. It's our day. It's your time. It's our time. We were brought to America to carry their burdens. Now, if we be merciful, we have to lift these blind Americans to salvation because they can't see their way into the kingdom of God unless the blind man that they made blind whom the Jesus made to see unless we lead them there they can't go if Mondale gets in we go to hell if Askew and Hart and Glenn get in we go to hell if Reagan gets in again, we stay in hell and go deeper in hell. There isn't but one way out. There isn't but one way out. And you spell that way, J-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. Jesse, Jesse Jackson. May God bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum.